Okay, I had to start the recording. So, so good morning, and uh, let's get going. Going to spend a couple of minutes going through the options briefly, and then dive right into good stuff. So, um, <clears throat> a couple quick overviews of remind us of CSS storage, and hopefully this is not totally new to you. Uh, CSS does manage all the storage, does protect the storage as we're going to talk about. Below the line, um, you can see the five or four DSAs mentioned. Um, hopefully not much of your stuff is 24-bit mode today, but you will find that CSS is going to use some of it, but very little. Hopefully all of yours is 31-bit mode at this point, if you will. Okay. Okay, above the line, where most of our stuff is, five DSAs. Now, quick little comment. Uh, storage violations do not occur. Well, I shouldn't say they don't occur. They do occur, but they only get detected in certain of the DSAs. And I'll make that a little bit clearer here <clears throat> in a couple of foils. But essentially, it's going to be the C DSAs, the Kicks DSAs, and the User DSAs. So the CDSA, UDSA below the line, the ECDSA, the EUDSA above the line, and as the past couple of versions of CICS have been starting to do, CICS does now have formalized uh, dynamic storage areas above the bar. And it's potential to get storage violations here in the UDSA and the GCDSA, although I doubt at this point if you have applications running 64-bit. Um, COBOL, as of yet, has not does not have a 64-bit compiler. Uh, so you'd have to be writing in uh, Java, C, or Assembler. Java's kind of out. It runs in its own little protected JVM. So now we're down to C or assembler code that you might write running 64-bit. Okay, and I have not seen many of those in my travels. Okay, so the UDSAs, the user DSAs, the Kix DSAs is where storage violations can get detected. Any place else within CICS, if you clobber some of the other data areas, they're not detectable. Speaking of those, so all the storage limits, if you will. The DSA lim, EDSA lim, uh, you can pick and modify on the fly. The mem limit, unfortunately, that controls all the storage above, the amount of storage, I should say, above the bar, is not changeable dynamically. So some of the options that we deal with here in storage violations or help us deal with them, storage protection. The modes of CICS versus user. If I do storage protection, yes, then CICS mode applications, if you will, run protect key eight, and user applications run protect key nine. So as a consequence, right, it is hard for a user mode application to overlay something of CICS. Try to, you will sock for. <clears throat> Okay, now, and hopefully we're all running that way. And if you do have CSS mode programs, which you can have, it can modify, your CSS mode programs can modify both user and CSS storage. And that's where we start running into issues of where you can clobber parts of CSS itself. Storage recovery, no. Please leave it that way. If you don't have it that way, please do. If you did storage recovery, yes, and I think I got a foil coming up, but if you did storage recovery, yes, does not <clears throat> affect, shall we say, the ability to recover from a storage violation. Okay, it basically says that CSS will not amend the task. <clears throat> okay. Uh, rep PGM equals protect. <clears throat> All of our programs today are supposed to be reentrant. And if they truly are, they go into, if we link them with rent option, they go into the RDSAs. And if you do rent PGM equals protect, all of your program storage is running protect key zero. Try to modify yourself, you will SOC 4. 
kind of the last one, Tran ISO, um, transaction isolation. Um, you mask storage violations with this one. I hate to say you get rid of them, you mask them. If you know that you have a couple transactions that <clears throat> uh, frequently get storage violations, we can specify them with isolate yes. And then the SI PARM transaction isolation, Tran ISO, we can say yes. Caution you in doing that. A lot of the IBM transactions are isolate yes, or and and when you turn it on, they will run in what's called subspaces. Your transactions that are all isolate no are not affected. Your transactions that are isolate yes become subspace eligible. Subspaces essentially are one megabytes of storage above the line, and it's kind of a hardware key protected. So if task one tries to overlay task two storage and they're both isolated, then we will actually end up with um, an event. You'll get a SOC 4. Of course, we'll still get a dump that comes out associated with that. So that's what transaction isolation. It doesn't really solve the storage violations. It kind of masks them. And if you are the perpetrator and uh, viola if you're the violator and victim at the same time, you're still going to violate your own storage, okay? Which means you will still get the nice, lovely storage violation dumps. Okay, so storage protection kind of as a picture, right? If one task, right, tries to modify another task or, um, pardon me, you can modify another task, Right, so task 422, task 418, as I've kind of indicated, can modify each other, right? But you cannot modify kick storage. You try to modify kick storage, your application is to abend. And that's the preferred way to run. Transaction isolation, like I said, everything is done in chunks or pieces, right? Extents, if you will. So if task 418 were to try to modify task 422, we would, right, abend, if you will. However, there are tasks that are not isolated that run in what's called a common subspace, and they can violate each other as before. So you're just kind of masking the violations. So what constitutes a storage violation? Within certain DSAs, okay, <clears throat> uh, CDSAs and the UDSAs primarily, I'll mention about the SDSA uh, a little bit later, okay? Uh, you'll see, I've got a little special thing for you there. But the C, the U, the EU, the EC, and that probably should be the EC there, um, GC, and GU are where we get violate storage. Yeah, in fact, I should mention this should really be the EC DSA. Got to correct my little slide. Hopefully the text is right. <laughs> Anyways, all the storage that you acquire on behalf of your task is going to get eight bytes on the front, eight bytes on the back, referred to as check zones, okay? So they're on the front and back, and a storage violation occurring is basically you've overlaid one of those check zones. Now, essentially, the check zone is a literal, as it says, contains the letter B, U, seven-digit task number, actually, you know, six different characters for the six different TSAs. When you... Um, Get, when you free the storage, right, or when the storage area gets freed, is when CSS checks the check zone. Now, as it says, if you specified storage recovery, yes, the only thing CSS is going to do is fix up the check zone. Any of the data that is damaged in the middle, right, is not going to get fixed up. Okay, so your task does not bend. You think everything is fine. And it's really not. 
Now, I say task does not bend. The vast majority of the storage violations do not occur until end of task. Our typical applications do not do free mains. So until end of task, they really don't get detected, okay? At that point, there's really not much to a bend. So that's why we get the storage violation dumps, the SM10102s, and very rarely do the task ever bend or do the applications ever really know about it until you tell them that they had a problem. And again, even if you were to do a storage recovery, yes, most of the stuff is going to happen at the end of task, so you really won't fix up the event. So that's why I say run with storage recovery. No, there's no sense even trying to do this. And if you should, um, the application should cause a free main to occur, or they do a free main, will get the uh, task to actually event, right? And the storage area, right, will get freed up. Okay, so fixing storage violations, right? Essentially, that's all it does. Checks, takes the, t and again, here's the characters, okay? M, B, C, U, G, and H for the kicks and user storage areas, okay? And all we really find is that one character followed by the task number, and when it fixes up, it literally just makes the storage, vi uh, the check zone valid. That's all it does. The violation, right, is only the check zone, as it says. Now, two other sub-pools of storage in CICS, SMTP24, SMTP, are terminal storage. They do not have check zones. They will participate in recoverable storage or, you know, storage that can be checked by CICS. They have what looks like the old storage accounting areas from many decades ago. Um, not really used to account for storage. All the storage is being accounted for by CSS with control blocks totally outside of our DSAs. So there's really hard for you to damage, shall we say, the parts of CSS that manage storage. You have to be totally, you know, outside of all the DSAs with your code. It's possible. You have to be in kicks mode, but it's very hard to do. Okay, anyways, the SMTP, SMTP24 or terminal, will contain terminal input output areas. And that is kind of often overlooked. I find a lot of people that say, well, I got this SM0102 dump, okay, but I can't see the storage violation, right? Doesn't show up. Well, one, you're task in, so not necessarily all the storage is going to show, and I will come up to that in a minute. Or if you're not at task end and the storage areas within CICS in what's called the AP domain do not show any damage, very could well be in this TLA. Okay? Sometimes you have to go looking. And again, all storage control blocks necessary to manage the storage are totally outside of the DSAs. Right? They're actually lower in addressability than any of the extended DSAs. And it is certain it's above the line, 31 bit and below all the DSAs. So you'd almost have to do negative addressing to get there. Okay, so common ways of creating storage violations. The most common, you have data and linkage sections. You have some form of storage layouts, most typically done by application level copy books where the data areas that they have mapped out actually are larger than the actual data area. So what I'm kind of indicating here, I might have a 500 byte data area, <clears throat> but however the definition the applications folks have is 600 bytes. So again, that's probably the most common cause, as it says, that the area definition is larger than the actual data. Second most common cause, invalid subscripts. So the application has a table defined, right, it, or an array of some type, and of course it occurs, let's say, 100 times. However, unfortunately, the index or subscript they're using is now at about 300. So they're outside the bounds of their table and into who knows what piece of storage. Many times if you're within your working storage arrays, or arrays in your working storage, 
you end up, you know, clobbering some other part of your working storage, which never gets detected. But if you're working with like an array that came in from a record or some form of external storage, temporary storage or what have you, was built up, you're going to go outside the bounds of storage, either clobber one of your own check zones, your CZs, or clobber parts of storage that, right, is owned by somebody else. And that's kind of common where the people are the, the victim is not the perpetrator, if you will. Sometimes when you do these kinds of things, what is outside the bounds of the storage is, is yours or that you own is storage not even allocated by CICS. It's just parts of pages that your application owns, but there is nothing else behind. So if you were to, in a sense, clobber beyond the check zone, if nobody owns a storage, Kix will never detect it. But the idea of thinking is you would clobber the check zone, and that's how CSS would detect the storage violation, because you've modified that. Sometimes you will acquire storage. You will use it. The example I'm kind of giving you is picking up a, a large MQ message. We probably don't want large MQ messages within our working storage in COBOL because working storages get cloned or copied for each task using the program. And we could quickly go SOS. So we might have to do a get main of a large data area, put the message to the queue, and then free main the large data area because we want to be good citizens. And when you do that and then you modify that data area, right, it's possible that that storage has been given to other people. You know, you might have acquired a four megabyte data area to build a message. <clears throat> And now when you free main it, you've given that four megabytes of storage back to CICS to use for somebody else. So as a consequence, right, other people own it, you try to move data to it, and you have just violated somebody else's check zones. This one very rarely results in a dump, storage violation dump, but you go in there and you kill tasks with outstanding weights. Um, if it happens to be ECBs that the task is waiting on, all of a sudden the app, the let's say like something like VSAM IO comes back and says, "Oh, I'm done. Post the ECB." Problem is, you've only gotten four bytes. I mean, the ECB is only four bytes. So chances are, if this occurs, it's going to modify storage, but very rarely is it going to be within a checksum. So it goes kind of undetected, hard to find. That's part of the title that says things that you were afraid to ask. All right, so <clears throat> let's get into the real meat of this. <clears throat> so a storage violation is going to produce a dump. If you've wiped out one of the check zones, storage violation is going to produce a dump, SMO 102, even if the task does not event. Okay. So we identify running tasks, user tasks. You'll find CSS system task running. And of course, we can do KE1DS1 to format out right those summaries in a dump. So we're going to see running tasks. And some of the ones are system oriented, which happens to be the first one. This is, of course, one of mine. And this one looks like it's not one of my tasks, right? Because it doesn't have a trans ID and or transaction number. Well, that's part of the issue. If all the storage is being free mained by CICS at end of task, that is occurring after the task has ended as far as the AP domain is concerned. And it's basically on the very tail end, and I think we'll see some of that in the trace captures I have. It's on the very tail end of the task cleaning up. So as a consequence, the application, as far as the application is concerned, it's gone. 
all tracks of the normal application have disappeared. So it does not really have a trans ID or task number associated with it at this point. It actually is part of XM, the transaction manager, right? So I would actually see, and okay, and let me back up for a second. So I have things like KE task, right, DS task, so I can tie to other summaries. So we can see, I can tie the DS tasks to dispatcher summaries, and I can see the two tasks running, okay? <clears throat> However, out here in this XM token, the first address, you can see the task number. So now I can clearly see task 77, but I can also see task 91. So now I can see remnants of that task in the system. And I can now take these addresses, and when I look at XM, you can clearly see task number 91, THM1 task, transaction now. So I've got a transaction ID to associate with things, and got a task number, which tells me a little bit of the story. But if I went to find that thing, again, you will see this, it's not there. Okay. So I use these summaries to pull this information and kind of put it together so I can figure out what am I really looking at? So I now now I have two of my own tasks, right? Trans THMY and THM1 in the system. And my gut feel at this point is the problem is the transaction 91 here, THM1. You know, that's running because it's the one that's probably getting all the stuff free made. Okay, so AP domain, I would only find 77. Once again, <clears throat> all I see is the tasks that are still there. Because your application is returning control back to CICS, it's at the point where <clears throat> it's cleaning up all that. So none of the data areas normally in the AP domain will even be there for task 91. And if I were to chase down all the storage areas, for task number 77, there would be no indication, right, of a storage violation, because it's not the one that's detected on. So this is another reason why storage violations are rather hard to find, because most of the time, there's very few visible tracks, unless you know what you're looking for. And that's hopefully why all of you are here. Okay, and again, once again, you know, our website if you, you know, joined after I got started, uh, you can go to our website, uh, www.themasync.com slash webinars, and you can download this thing. And again, you'll find extensive notes going along with the slides. All right, so don't really have any clear-cut tracks so far, <clears throat> but I'm a very big proponent of trace as part of this whole problem determination class, this is just a piece of our problem determination and structure class for CICS, shameless plug. Um, I talk about what trace should be on to help solve problems, to help deal with situations like this. And I get trace overhead down quite you know, a bit compared to what normally would be. And part of the reason I want to see trace is exactly what you're going to see right now. Okay, and that's, there will be these exception trace entries that get produced. Now, when I look at exception trace entries, it's going to tell me, oh, by the way, story check failed, and here's the address. The trace entries are documented in an IBM manual called trace entries, and it will tell you that data area two here is the address of the storage being free mained. And data area three is the length of it. Now the length will be in hex. So this is essentially uh, about 524 bytes, right? 512 plus 16, 528, can't do math. When it shows it to you, data area four will be the first 256. Data area 5 is the last 256. 
Now, as you can clearly see, the ending check zone is perfectly fine. It's the U with the task number 91. So there's an indication of task number 91, right? You can't find it in the AP domain because AP domain doesn't know about it. Transaction manager did, however. And when you look at the leading check zone, it's kind of, uh, shall we say, not what it's supposed to be. For grins, IBM will give you also 1K before the damaged area. That's data area number six. And 1K after the damaged area. And when I look at that, I can see, right, that this data area is perfectly fine. Just so happens to be a 1K data area, okay, behind it. However, when I look at the before, I can see that it's clearly, right, bad. Now, I will say this. If it's complaining about this data area here, and it's detected this bad check zone, when it goes to free main this one, it will get another dump. So the data violation actually started in the area before the one that CSS is saying is bad and has gone through and overlaid the ending check zone on this one and the beginning check zone on the next. So I will get multiple SML 102 dumps out of this. Okay. So now I start to see the tracks right, within the dump, if you will. Please notice, however, we are task XM as opposed to 91. So there is your, right, visibility of the fact that AP Domain knows nothing about it and why your developers, you know, the application developers see nothing of a storage violation because their task has not abandoned. If I did, however, <coughs> get an abend. Now, the AEXZ would typically occur, this is a couple snippets out of a uh, transaction dump. This would occur primarily because the application did the free mate. Not waiting till end of task, but the application did the free mate. Kind of like I showed you earlier, right? I acquire a piece of storage to put a large MQ message I build the MQ message, I free main the storage. If one of the check zones of the free main, uh, the storage area for the MQ message would have been overlaid, I would get an application event along with the, uh, the uh, SMO 102 dump. What I love is the applications folks get this dump, AEXZ, they look it up and it says a serious error has occurred in a CSS component. It doesn't tell them much more and they freak. Okay, now, very bits and pieces of the transaction dump, right? So they look all this up, they see the fact that, oh, by the way, you know, they can't, they have no clue as to what's going on, they get freaked. You can see the task number 91. And when they get down to transaction storage, they see no messages. Unless they know what they're looking for, they see nothing. Well, if you happen to look, you can see the check zone has been overlaid. But there is no message, right? As it says, please note there's no clear indication showing the violation. They got this dump that says they got a serious failure in a CSS component. They see nothing in here that makes any sense to them, right? Unless they're very technical applications, folks. And then as a consequence, right, they come to you as administrators and say, oh, uh, hey, what's this mean? Only if they're the ones free in the storage. Terminal storage will show also in the dump, okay? Does not show in the AP domain. If you looked in the AP domain, you'd have to look at what's called the TCP storage, and that can get rather large especially if you've got a high number of sessions and things. But within the transaction dump, they will see terminal storage, okay? But they literally have to look at the beginning eight bytes and the ending eight bytes to see the violation, okay? So, again, your developers really don't see anything. 
All right, another one. Okay. So this is going to move kind of quick, but you know, again, the text explains a lot of it. <clears throat> so once again, all right, we got this dump SMO 102. I start looking at my kernel, so I have these two tasks, and I don't see much tracks here. So again, I'll take this task address, right, so I can match the dispatcher summary. And again, I don't see much here, right? But I look out here and I can see task number 56 in this XM token. So now I got a little piece of information, right? But most of the information at the here doesn't really tell me anything. So when I go and look at the, AP, the transaction manager, I do find 56, right? It's THMG in my case. So now I have a little bit of something to go on. I know the application transaction, right? But when I look in the AP domain, once again, because it's long after the AP domain is gone, I find nothing. One little snippet of information here. Once again, I will be able to find an exception trace entry, even in the transaction dump or in the system dump, right? That says, oh, I've got a violation here. Again, please note, it says it's XM. So this is after, right, the AP domain has ended, task in the AP domain. Once again, I will have these actual address here. And the length here in this case is hex 50 fairly small. So the data areas, as we can see, here's the first so many bytes, it's perfectly fine. Data area five is the last so many bytes and we can see it's got damage to it. Once again, show 1K before, but here we can clearly see it's fine. And 1K after, right? And basically what we have here is something that really doesn't matter. I say that because this is not even a piece of storage that has been allocated to anybody, okay? I can't tell that from looking at the storage, but simply because, right, there's no check zones, no nothing, it is possible it's still a storage area. But I doubt it because, again, I would expect to find in this at least in the front end, a checksum. What I find is essentially looks like an address to me, okay? So once again, right, not a lot of tracks of what's going on here. One of the little tricks I use, right, you notice the address I backed up here for a second, uh, 28 Charlie 05140. If I substitute three zeros, Right, because again, I'm really not sure what, I, what I'm looking at. If I substitute three zeros for the address, and I go to uh, and list it out through IPCS, I get a page boundary. When CSS allocates storage to a task, it does so on a page boundary. <clears throat> so I can actually see that. For every hex 1000, okay, <clears throat> I can get a 4K page. So that is how CSS is allocating storage to a task, right? 4K page basis. So when I pick it apart, here's the bad address, and of course I can see the leading check zone's fine. Before that, I can see the check zone of the previous storage area, although I don't have the whole storage area. It was only hex 50 long, so I get down here to 190, and I find out this is damaged, right? But what's behind here, is probably storage that hasn't been allocated. However, I do see a trailing check zone down here. So now I begin to wonder that I really clobber something in here. Okay. So I do see what looks like other storage areas for task 56. Now, I don't show it to you here, but I can go to the storage areas and storage manager and piece together who owns the storage, how big they are, and so on. But I'm again, I'm looking for something that, that helps me get back to an application, right? The only thing I have now, it's THMG. 
So now I gotta go find out what programs, right? Which I can do. However, <clears throat> one of the things I've done is I go to the exception and, and you gotta kind of pay attention here as I go down the list of entries here, you'll notice that the trace sequences go down. I'm actually scanning backwards in trace. So I find the stories exception, right? And then I find before that EIP. So now I can see this is an exit from a link to a program called THMG. Now I've got a program to work with, okay? And a bit more, you know, it gives me a com area address and that. Of course, then I can find the previous once again, and I find the entry to the link, okay? And I can now, right, or I shouldn't say that, I'm finding the address, pardon me, not finding the IP, right? Take the address, add eight bytes, right, because the address in the thing is with the check zone. And once I find it, I notice here is the address. So it's the com area being passed to program G. Find it once again, it's the entry, right? So now I can see that this was actually the com area passed to program G. Find the address once again, and I see the get main for it. Notice the length, however, hex four zero, not five zero, right? The hex 40 is essentially minus the two eight bytes on the front and back, right? The checksums. So the five zero you saw earlier is because it includes the checksums. Okay. So then I went looking for the entry, right? For this to load the main entry uh, entries. So this is one of the traces I leave turned on for the <clears throat> program. Because I want to get the load point entry point so I can go back against the source list. Okay. Once I find that, I can find this in the loader domain, I can actually get the address, and now I can get its load points and entry points, right? Trace it back to the program, <clears throat> picking up a speed here a little bit. So I have this com area that I'm pretty sure is bad. Here's the link to the program G, right? And I guess I should say this. I came, this is the loader domain token for the program that I came from, or, and I find out it's in program A, so I got my program A source list. I find the link to G passing the com area. Now when I look at the com area, it's hex 64 bytes, okay? Or I should say character 64 bytes. When I go to program G, I look at the com area, it's defined as 73. So here's a case where, and please ignore my bad programming statements, right, to com area overlay. Obviously, I contrived the dumps, you know, forced them to occur. Um, but now I've got a very common situation. One program has linked to another with a com area. However, the link, the program G in this case, the link to program, the definition for the com area is bigger than what's actually being passed, okay? So as a consequence, right, I will get the dump, okay? All right, so trying to keep tabs and get a little bit of time, make sure I can get through most of this in time. Again, extensive notes with the slides. So it says a little different scenario to process, okay? So once again, I got the SMO 102. I look and see what's running. Of course, I don't see much in, dis in kernel. I don't see much in dispatcher, task number 57. So in XM, I can still find it. It's THMG once again, but in AP domain, I cannot see the tracks. So I go looking for the storage exception trace entry, and it gives me another address, this you know, hex 1,000, or 100,000, rather. And it says, okay, that's the data area, and oh, by the way, it's hex 60 bytes long. Gives me the leading, check zone is fine, 
I look at the ending, and of course it's clobbered. 1K before, and once again I find all zeros. Now here's a clear indication, right? Probably that area before, this data area 6, doesn't exist. If you'll notice, I'm on an even zero boundary, right? So I'm on a page. So I'm, the storage area I'm working with is actually on the page boundary. Pro chances are this data area before me is on a page that nobody owns, hence all the zeros. However, 1K afterwards, and I can definitely see the leading area is bad, okay? Of course, I can also see the ending area here too, but for a different task. So here's a case where I probably have damaged somebody else's storage. Don't know that for a fact, but I possibly have. Okay, so once again, you know, this is happening at the end of my task as well as remains. So I list it out, and I get the page, and I can still see the areas, right? So I can see the clear thing, clear indication, but it says while the task is almost gone, we can still see a little few remnants, okay? So the good news is in, is in this is that the damage area begins on a page, so no other areas behind it, right? So damage is related, you know, uh, related to the task, which, right? So once again, find the exception, take the address, right? Find it, and notice when I find that address, adding eight bytes, it's part of a file control rewrite. Okay, so I rewrote the record, okay, I find the address again, here's the entry to it, right? So I find it, it's part of a file control rewrite where I actually have done I, um, from, find it again, and this time I find the, right, this is kind of going backwards now, I find this read statement, and, and notice it's a set, so I'm processing in linkage section, once again, not my work in storage. So as because I did the set, CSS has done the get main, and notice CSS says, I'm going to do a get main here for hex 50 bytes, and I read into it, right? However, right, I do the rewrite, backing up one little slide here, you notice it's, is hex 80 bytes, or it is 80 bytes, that the record's being written. So CSS has actually retrieved the record, right? Done a get main, put the record in. The record is 80 bytes long, hex 50 or character 80, right? But you notice a little thing here. When I did the read, I told CICS the data area that I'm reading, you know, that I have, the copy book, if you will, that's in linking section, is actually 90 bytes. I specified the length of it, and I said it's actually 90 bytes. But CISS only has an 80 byte record. So I go and find my programs once again, right, that are involved. And, right, I can find, I repeated, uh, hmm, not sure why I did that. Oh, okay, one's the program for the actual read occurring, the other one's the linked to program. Okay, and then I can get into the program and find, you know, the read statement. I can find out the data area, and when I look at the listing, right, I can see this data area, and it's hex 90. So the uh, actual record area I have is 90 bytes in program G, but the physical record was only 80 bytes. So here's an example of the read. So I said length of inventory record set, okay, and if I did not say length of 80 here, it still would have been 80 bytes, okay, because CSS would have read it. Kix can only give me the actual data I have, okay? So as a consequence, I've overlaid the area right? Because I don't, because I use the length of here, I don't give CSS the opportunity to tell me, oh, by the way, the record I just read was only 80 bytes long. Had I used the data area and worked in storage, I could have known that, okay? 
very common thing. You know, you got these data areas that you that are described, and they're actually bigger, right, than the actual data that CSS has returned to you. <clears throat> okay, folks, almost done. Now the uh, presentation goes on. I give you another scenario <clears throat> after what you're going to see. Okay, but I wanted to bring this to your point uh, to your site, if you will, before we go. This so is one more thought, right? So we're starting to see more applications doing get made shared. Okay, so as a consequence, right? Then this is the kind of areas that are, appear in that storage management area. So what I end up with is I have these data areas, right, represented by this shared subfold. So this is kind of like outside of my transaction. This is what they refer to as storage control element or SCE. And there's the address and there's the length of the acquired storage. Address and length of storage, okay? And then here's the free part of the page and the length of it. So these are totally outside of DSAs. These are Right, used to manage and piece together all storage that you acquire. And I can clearly see for this particular task the starting points and the addresses, right? Then the length of all the storage. When I go into that storage area and list it out, here I listed out this whole page. So I, it began on a page, zeros, right? List out the whole page. I want you to notice. No check zones. So the use of things like by our application using shared storage, right? There are no check zones. So any storage violation which occurred here would not be visible. So I wanted to kind of point that out, right? So it's really not a recoverable subpool, as it says. Okay, so a few minutes over. Um, and so this is a presentation I've done. I actually will do this presentation again at the next share in Atlanta, if you'll be there. Okay. Um, so hopefully you gain some insights a little bit. Uh, if you got any questions, by all means, send me an email. I thank you for all for attending. And again, there's another scenario behind this one I'm not going to go through, but if you've downloaded the... Um, uh, PDF from the website, again, www.themeinsync.com slash webinars. You can actually see all the rest of the thing. So I thank you all for attending, and uh, it's been a pleasure. And I'm going to terminate the uh, thing at this point. If you got any questions, send me an email.